Welcome. This is presentation number 20 <coughs> in our series, Rereading the Fourth Gospel, the story of Jesus the Revealer. This will be the next to last presentation. The last one, number 21, will have the title, Believing Without Seeing. This presentation, the title is Feed My Sheep. And the character that comes to view there is mostly Peter. Uh, so you could say <coughs> that this is uh, Peter's story in the fourth <coughs> gospel. He will appear on the first <coughs> page and we will read it right at the beginning. <coughs> Among the first of the disciples, one of the two who heard John speak, John the Baptist speak, and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked intently at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. And this is a translation from Aramaic. So <coughs> Cephas is Peter in Aramaic and Peter is rock in English. And <coughs> so that is how he appears on the first page. <coughs> and this is an illustration by Caravaggio. This is a young Jesus with Andrew and Peter at the beginning of the story. And let me just do an aside. I have a friend. His name is Christopher Dalsede. He advises me on this series sometimes, gives me a little feedback. And he said, I like your illustrations. I think you should have more Caravaggios. So here is for him a Caravaggio. <coughs> And then Peter appears on the last page <coughs> uh, also. And this is where we will focus most in the end, at least today, uh, on this uh, last appearance. So when they had finished breakfast so after the resurrection, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, it's exactly the same wording as in chapter 1, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. And <coughs> illustrations of this last scene are fewer. Uh, I think this one is Raphael. And this is afterwards. This is Jesus as the good shepherd. That's a very good depiction here. And the sheep. And here is Peter and uh, that conversation that we have in John and we will return to it later. <coughs> so, how to name Peter? How do we name him? Cephas, also known as Peter. Uh, that because it is a prominent thing that Jesus <coughs> names him at the beginning. So, we could say, Peter for what you are. A forceful personality, which he definitely seems to be in all the accounts. Or, Peter, for what you will become, a rock. That's sort of anticipating something, matur maturing, uh, a sort of maturing process. And that is a view that many hold, but I would hold it with, some, uh, some, um, with a caveat, because here... I am reading, going to read a passage from Paul's letter to the Galatians. That is Paul, the Apostle Paul, and we know he wrote it. There is no uh, sort of ambiguity about authorship or connection. And Paul was a pioneer missionary, and he had been... <coughs> Uh, he had come to Galatia, which is in the middle of Turkey. Uh, uh, and this... His arrival in Galatia may have been <coughs> about even less than 20 years after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. 
So when this letter is written, Paul is no longer in Galatia, he is somewhere else, and he writes this letter uh, as a sort of follow-up <coughs> to these Galatians. And guess what? Peter appears in the letter, Cephas, under his Aramaic name. But when Cephas came to Antioch, which was the sort of center of, of the uh, new faith mission for a while, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Why am I reading this? I'm reading this <coughs> to just nuance at least this idea that Jesus names Peter uh, a rock because he will be a rock. Well, he isn't yet, at least not totally, because he is showing the failure of nerve here. He is, he is not standing firm on a conviction. He is putting distance between himself and the Gentile believers. He doesn't want to be seen with them. And <clears throat> Paul doesn't like it. When I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? So here <clears throat> Paul takes Peter to task for not showing conviction, for not showing courage, certainly, or to play on his name, for not being a rock, you might say. And here is El Greco, <coughs> these are not, <coughs> these are not uh, Semitic uh, people, but <coughs> this, this is El Greco's illustration of Peter and Paul together. You don't find that very often in art. And this is Paul with the text, and this is Peter with the keys. As we know, he's always depicted like that. <coughs> but in the Galatian correspondence, <coughs> it is Paul who is the rock and not Peter. And so uh, back to my options here. Peter for what you are, a forceful personality, that would be work. Peter for what you will become, a rock, maybe that will work. Or <coughs> Peter for what you are in my eyes, despite your flaws. Because he is still flawed, at least 20 years later in the Galatian uh, in, in Paul's letter to Galatians. <clears throat> well, let's uh, look at Peter in between. What I mean by in between is between his calling, between the beginning in chapter 1 and the ending in chapter 21 when Jesus tells him, feed my sheep. So what do we see <clears throat> him do <clears throat> in the fourth gospel in the between uh, times? <clears throat> so here is in chapter 6, after the feeding of the multitudes, and after Jesus has said, I am the bread from heaven, and saying quite strange things about eating his flesh and drinking his blood in order to have life. And that is, offends many of the followers, and they turn away uh, and will no longer follow him. And then Jesus says to the disciples, are you going to go away too? And then we read, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. So there is Peter confessing and also professing loyalty. And then, this is from uh, my illustration, this is Duccio's uh, picture of the foot washing. And we have <coughs> read that before, we can read it again. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? By no means you will wash my feet ever. So <coughs> forceful personality, uh, outspoken, somewhat impetuous perhaps. <coughs> and we have one more uh, also at the last supper when 
Jesus says someone will betray him. And then Simon Peter therefore motioned to the beloved disciple to ask Jesus of whom he was, he was speaking. So <clears throat> this are, these are in-between scenes or flashes uh, uh, from Peter's life. <clears throat> And we have him as a forceful personality here. Jesus is arrested. And, and that, at that point, Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. And here we have the depiction of a forceful, aggressive, somewhat militant Peter, it's cutting off, it's wanting to defend Jesus uh, by force. <clears throat> so we have a phenomenon too, <clears throat> that he, especially as we near the end of the story, that Peter seems again and again to be paired with the beloved disciple. So that gives him another <clears throat> uh, foot up, you might say, uh, as an important figure in the story. He is paired with the beloved disciple at the supper. He is paired with him at the tomb. He is paired with him at the lake and at the end, these stories, where the beloved disciple is mentioned explicitly and Peter is mentioned explicitly. There is a sort of something missing there because the beloved disciple is at the cross. And we will look at that. There is one other possibility here. Let's look at this one. <coughs> and this leads us into the drama that will soon take place. This is after the arrest of Jesus <coughs> and the disciples following, at least our main character, this person who is most in the know in the gospel, he will <coughs> follow closely the proceedings against Jesus. So Simon Peter and another disciple follow Jesus. And the issue is here, is that other disciple, the beloved, the, the beloved disciple? Many people think so, even though he isn't mentioned here. So that could be another option. Simon Peter and another disciple follow Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate, like he didn't have a ticket. You know, he wasn't, he, he, he didn't clear security, as it were. So the other disciple, and we wonder, the one who Jesus loved, is he the one? So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. So... And there is a possibility that he is present, at least to some extent, at the trial. But he is not at the cross. We'll look at why in a minute. So we move forward, and I'm, re I'm not skipping any verses here. Everything is sort of continuous. Peter has now been let into the courtyard. And something is happening with Jesus. And I have Rembrandt here because three times now in that setting, people will ask Peter, various people will ask Peter about his relationship to Jesus. And I think Rembrandt's depiction may just be the best one. There are many. Let's read the text. The woman that one who guarded the gate, said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, Maybe he needed to think. Maybe he said it quickly. I am not. And... I have to step here. I am not. I want you to see the whole thing here and Rembrandt to sort of catch the feeling or the ambience of this moment. And I have a Caravaggio to do the same thing. 
and you see how the faces are illuminated and how the faces are important. It's the same thing here. They are close. They need to be close because <coughs> the light, it's evening, it's, uh, there isn't that much light. So there is Rembrandt, there is Caravaggio. And there is context. What's the context? Well, the context is what happened the night before. The night before, when Jesus was washing Peter's feet. Is he one of the disciples or isn't he? This scene happens less than 12 hours before he will say, you are one of those. I am not. So this puts context, this adds to the drama, because Jesus came to him less than 12 hours earlier and said to him, uh, uh, Peter said to Jesus, first, are you washing my feet? Jesus said, you do not know, <coughs> you do not know what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, by no means you will wash my feet ever. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share in me. And now, even though Peter has newly washed feet, it's like he has no share. I do not know him. You know, that's the context. That's the additional drama. I call that what the previous one, I called it strike one. Let's do strike two. <clears throat> now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. And here is Duccio's uh, illustration of that. And there is Peter is here. And there is a kind of search for anonymity here to make, to be present and yet to seem invisible, to seem like you are one of the everyone else. And there is the fire that they are use, uh, warming themselves on, and the scene is utterly, seems utterly authentic. <coughs> Between verse 18 and verse 25, John will, dis or the gospel will describe the interrogation of Jesus by the high priest. But we are skipping that. <coughs> We're just picking up verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. And then strike three. <coughs> and here another illustration. There are so many of them. They are all very, very good. They are just... 15th, 16th century illustration, 17th century, some too. And uh, we have Peter here, and we have some people who don't care, and <coughs> some that are aware of the conversation. One of the, and this is a, an interesting one in the Gospel, uh, in John's Gospel, because <coughs> of the detail here. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? You know, sort of knowing that he was there and he was the one. Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. The rooster crowed. crowed. And this is another important thing. So. Uh, and let's just go back to the pairing with the beloved disciple. <coughs> so, uh, so we say that he is paired with the beloved disciple at the supper, at the cross, at the tomb, at the lake, and at the end. But he is not paired with, uh, oh no, he's not paired with him at the cross, that's what I meant to say. He's at the the beloved disciple is at the supper, at the cross, at the tomb, at the lake, and at the end. The beloved disciple is here at the cross. Peter is not there with him at the cross. Where is he? Well, <coughs> he's somewhere else. <coughs> this is Peter. After he has denied that he knows Jesus. And we can do better than that. We can do El Greco. 
who sees a kind of penitent Peter, a weeping Peter, as he will do, <coughs> because we can also read a very similar story, even more dramatic in the Gospel of Mark, in the probably oldest synoptic gospel, and slightly more sort of forceful, at the third in uh, uh, question, third time he is asked, were you one of them? Peter, uh, Mark says that he began to curse and he swore an oath. I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for a second time. Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. That's a poignant scene of Peter in that setting. And it is the rooster, the cock, the crowing of the rooster that sort of puts him in a state of alert, that sort of makes him remember, makes him see, makes him understand. And let's see if we can do it. I will try and just see if we can hear it. Do one more. So, <coughs> Matthew adds to the text we just read in Mark. Uh, Matthew adds a little detail. He went out, he said, and wept bitterly. Peter is not at the cross. He is off somewhere else, nursing the wounds of defeat. <coughs> and this is a depiction of him in a sort of state of grief, self-blame, just feeling that he lost it. He just didn't, didn't do it. He failed. This is defeat writ large in the story. And I want to read again <coughs> from Eric Auerbach's book, because this is not often understood. I have read this uh, before, his book Mimesis or Mimesis, how <coughs> reality is represented in Western literature and how reality is represented in the Gospels in the New Testament. And this is a remarkable book that he wrote during the war with no notes or anything. So let's read it. <coughs> Surely the New Testament writings are extremely effective. The tradition of the prophets and the Psalms are alive in them. And in some of them, those written by the authors of more or less pronounced Hellenistic culture, we can trace the use of Greek figures of speech. But the spirit of rhetoric, sort of attempt to artificially dramatize a text or something, <coughs> the spirit of rhetoric, a spirit which classified subjects in genera and invested every subject with a specific form or style of style as the one garment becoming it in virtue of its nature. That spirit could not extend its dominion to them for the simple reason that their subject would not fit into any of the known genres. And here comes our application. A scene like Peter's denial fits into no antique genre. It is too serious for comedy, too contemporary and everyday for tragedy, politically too insignificant for history, and the form which was given it is one of such immediacy that its like does not exist in any literature of antiquity. What is he saying? He's saying that this is a story you should read, not as though you should read it as a story depicting something that happened and depicting it unembellished in the sort of immediacy of what took place there. Peter had, Jesus had warned Peter, you will deny me. Peter had said, I won't deny you ever. 
he denies him. And it goes three times. And afterwards, he goes out and he weeps. <coughs> we are now in chapter 21 <coughs> and the return of the revealer. It is also the farewell of the revealer uh, in this last chapter in the gospel. After these things, Jesus revealed. I wish to use that word. The NRSV says showed, which is fine. But it is a revelatory uh, moment, so we should stick with, uh, John's la uh, with the language here. <coughs> Jesus revealed himself to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself thus. That's how he begins it. And <coughs> for one last time, we get to know where we are. This is somewhere here at the lake. Here is the town of Tiberias that gives the lake its name in, in the fourth gospel. And there is, so we have moved back to Galilee. And Galilee is home turf to many of the earliest disciples because they were from Bethsaida and they were from this region. And Nathaniel, he was from Cana. So <coughs> the location uh, matters. <coughs> and <coughs> <coughs> Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples, seven of them. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And here we have to make do with a composite illustration uh, partly from the beginning of the gospel, it also uh, gospels. It also works as an ending scene: Galilee, fishing, and catching nothing initially here in the story. And and I have given it a headline. <coughs> this is the Galilee gang, the core group for Jesus. And I am also saying that we catch them at a the moment of disappointment. There's a sort of in-between. Should they go on? Will they give up? That's where we are. So in this setting, back in Galilee, we can see a few things, make a few observations. Then the first one is that the ending of the fourth gospel recapitulates the beginning, because many of the people who are here named they also appear in chapter 1 uh, and are the sort of first recruits of, of, of Jesus. So the ending of the fourth gospel recapitulates the beginning. And, and the ending of the fourth gospel also recapitulates the beginning of the synoptics. It's only here in John that we get to know that they have something to do with fishing. They go fishing. It's not like fishing is a hobby. It used to be their livelihood. Only here at the end of the story in, in the fourth gospel do we know that there is something to do with fishing. But we know that. We have known that all along because of the synoptics. <coughs> they were fishermen. And then, <coughs> this is how I sense the atmosphere here. Will it be disillusion and retreat when Peter says, I am going fishing. It has the suggestion that I am going to give up. I'm not com going to continue. I am going back to my old profession. I'm going home. And they have solidarity too. We're going with you. Sort of, that's sort of the ending. Going back to where it began. So we can ask, Will it be disillusion and retreat, or will it be revelation and restoration? And you can guess which one it will be, but I think the question <coughs> should, be answer, should be asked. <coughs> so, uh, yes, so we can read on. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, <coughs> but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. And the idea of children here, this is a, how a father talks to children. So there is a sort of fatherliness to it. They answered him, no. 
he said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. And I think this one at least is Raphael. The other one I mentioned, uh, attributed to him may not have been. Uh, Peter, Jesus, catch of fish here. Uh, and my title, Daybreak, both because that is the time of day and because there is a certain sort of daybreak texture to it in a metaphoric sense. And <coughs> then Jesus would be recognized. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. That's not what we do in our time. <coughs> when we jump into the sea in our time, we take off our clothes. <coughs> but never mind. <coughs> the iconographer has it here. He has uh, Peter now swimming ashore. He couldn't wait to stay in the boat. He has something on his mind. What could it be? <coughs> and... Uh, so, but the other disciples <coughs> came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and uh, bread. So, <coughs> the revealer has returned, not just as himself to show it's me, but as someone who reveals characteristics, reveals a way of doing things, he reveals in some ways the presence of God in the world. And the iconographers are not doing a bad job here. There is the fire here, and there is a sort of caring hand, and fire there with fish on it and bread. You know, these are quite evocative uh, things. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. <coughs> and Jesus here actually acts in the role of the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd discourse in chapter 10 is very much echoing in our chapter here. And we can read <coughs> on. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. People have wondered, what's the number, Symboli symbolic of this or that? Or just a precise number as it was remembered by eyewitnesses. That seems to me to be a better theory. Uh, and though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And that is a strange thing, recognition, and yet a certain strangeness. How do you react when that person was crucified and died not so long ago? How do you act? Yes, he's risen. It takes a while to get used to it, to sort of do a reset. <coughs> they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. It's like a communion service. It's like the Last Supper. It's like <coughs> feeding the uh, 5,000 again. There is a, a sort of theme uh, going on here. Uh, <coughs> this was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And in our illustration here, we see a sort of close-up of Jesus and Peter. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? We already read that text. Now we are back to it to look at it more in detail. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I think we need to have stretch out time here. I don't think we should do this too fast. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And we need to pause. We need to also see eye contact, faces looking at each other. And then Jesus, while looking at Peter, saying to him, feed my lambs. 
And you see here my panel is empty. Because while I can find 10, 20, many more of the betrayal scene when Peter betrays Jesus or denies Jesus, I can find many of those. I cannot find a single one that does justice to this scene. Betrayal is a better, sells better. There is more market for betrayal than for restoration. There should be faces close faces close to each other, Jesus and Peter here. I do not find it. I find this one, uh, and this is a depiction of the scene in chapter 21, because we have the feeding of the sheep here in the corner, and we have Peter in a sort of devotion to Jesus here. It's not too bad. It certainly is much better than this one. That puts Peter, this is from the Sistine Chapel by Perugino, I think about 1560 or so on. Here is Jesus handing the keys to Peter, here in, in one huge and dominant panel in the Sistine Chapel, uh, here. And then you have these symbols of power in the background, the Arch of Constantine, and Peter has now become an imperial figure, a political figure. And we don't find that illustration we need for the conversation that happens uh, uh, at the lake. So the conversation with Jesus at the lake is implicitly aware of the three times Peter denied Jesus. And three times Jesus will ask Peter, do you love me? So that conversation echoes, the conversation of Peter's denial echoes in here. And we can see that the wounds on Peter, Jesus is aware of them. Uh, let's read the text and I will say a few more things. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend to my sheep. And again, we see that Jesus, what could he have said? He could have said, why did you do that? How could you be so weak? You know, you have to show more strength. You know, he could have talked to Peter about the past. He talks to Peter about the future. And he knows that Peter needs no help remembering defeat. He knows defeat in his bones. So you don't say anything about it. This is a master healer at work. You can give him credit for that. <coughs> so the third time, <coughs> he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And here, the narrator gives us a little bit of breathing space. He says how oh, Peter felt. Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So and we have in our lives, we have the past and we have the present. And there is a future coming up. The question is, will the future be determined by the past? To what extent will past failure in some ways uh, dominate, in some ways tie us down and make our future, uh, sort of put our future at risk? So Jesus has a remedy for that and he talks to Peter as the Good Shepherd, and our, the conversation ends like this. <clears throat> Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. You were sort of on your own, self-managing. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go explanation. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this he said to him, follow me. And 
<coughs> again with Caravaggio's help, this is how the artist depicts what posterity thought Jesus said, that Jesus would, uh, that Peter would be crucified too. But in the memory of tradition, he would be crucified upside down and would die as his master, be that as it may. <coughs> we have no documentation for that this is what happened, but we have an impression that Jesus is taking Peter, who is a sheep, and he wants to turn him into a shepherd. That is clearly the implication of what happens here when Jesus says three times, feed my lamb, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, at the end. Let's pause a little here <coughs> without being distracted by uh, Caravaggio. <coughs> the conversation that Jesus has with Peter at the end, sure, it restores Peter. It tells him, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. It restores Peter. But it is also a prescription for how Jesus imagines the believing community to be. A caring community. Peter has in some ways a track record of self-care. He will have a future of caring for others, being someone who cares about others, who is in some ways imitating the Good Shepherd, who is himself becoming a Good Shepherd. And that is how the new community will be hasn't quite been that, that we have to acknowledge. Those of us who have experiences in believing communities, it hasn't quite been that way. <coughs> so let's move on to our, to our uh, uh, s s summary here. And uh, here is the retrospective. <coughs> Peter. He is the most or a prominent character among the disciples in all the Gospels. The fourth Gospel is no different there on that point. <coughs> the portrait in the fourth Gospel is not significantly different from the synoptics. Peter has a strong personality, he is devoted, he is temperamental, and he lacks self-knowledge. He doesn't quite see his limitations. He doesn't quite know his vulnerabilities. That's true. In fact, indeed, he is the epitome of a sheep in need of a shepherd. That's how he comes across. <coughs> he is paired with the beloved disciple again and again, except at the cross. He is out somewhere weeping. Maybe he is at a distance. He is simply not there in the, in the thick of it. In the parting conversation that I will call a hands-on therapy session, if there ever was one, the Good Shepherd overcomes Peter's self-blame and he restores the other people's trust in him. He doesn't need to blame Peter. Peter manages that by self-blame. He needs to overcome that in Peter and he has to also do it in some public way to restore other people's trust in him. In the fourth gospel, more explicitly than in the synoptics, the good shepherd turns sheep into shepherds. We can say no less than that. And this one, feed my sheep, is not only a word of restoration for Peter, it is a prescription for what to be and what to do as members of a believing community, to build community together as shepherds. <coughs> Finally, belief and believing competes with love for pride of place in this gospel. But at the end, the accent falls on love. Simon, son of Jonah, and you and I can substitute our own name there and have Jesus speaking to each one of us. We'll do Simon, son of Jonah. Do you love me? <coughs>